Have you ever been in a situation where there seems to be no solution? It's as if you're backed into a corner, suffocating, and you feel like you can't escape this problem at all. Take a moment to look back and recall the worst challenge you've ever faced. What were the things running through your mind back then? You see, Job went through one of the toughest trials ever. He lost his wealth and home, suffered from deteriorating health, and his children passed away. You might be wondering why I'm telling you this, and to make it clear, it's not to compare. I'm not here to tell you that there are other people who are facing greater difficulties than you. It's not a competition to see who has it worse. My point is that the Bible features stories that are no different than ours. The people there are just ordinary people like us. It's like these stories were written so that we would learn from them and apply them to our own lives. I may not know what you're dealing with, but I do know that you may find yourself in Job's helpless position. And my goal is to remind you of the kind of victory God gives his followers after trials. Job knew something very special. He held on to this knowledge about God so that even when all his possessions were taken away from him one by one, he was able to remain calm and collected. In Job 42, 2, Job said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Now, is this the very first thought that comes to mind when you're facing a battle? Job knew that there was nothing he could ever do to physically recover his losses. Because of this, he concluded that trusting God was his only resort. Do you notice how lifting our problems to God is often our last resort? In some cases, humans exhaust their confidence in themselves to get themselves out of a predicament. And when they realize that they're on the losing side, they turn to God. Our Creator becomes the last option, and this should not be the case. I'm encouraging you to build a new habit starting today. The moment you experience a minor inconvenience that foreshadows a time of trouble, immediately confess these four words. God is in control. At any place in time, when you feel that you're facing difficulty, let this statement be your natural response. It doesn't matter whether you say it out loud or mentally, all you have to do is proclaim it in your heart until it becomes your default response. As told in Isaiah 45, six through seven, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west, that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and I create calamity. I am the Lord who does all things. Whatever you put in God's hands will never be lost. Daniel 2.21 declares, He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. His responsibility encompasses everything from small details to gigantic things. No problem is too petty or too complicated in his eyes, especially when it concerns his children. To quote Charles R. Swindle, when you accept the fact that sometimes seasons are dry and times are hard and that God is in control of both, you will discover a sense of divine refuge because the hope then is in God and not yourself. The truth is we're anxious beings. One inconvenience happens and bam, we panic like crazy. We eat worries for breakfast and go to bed with our minds filled with negative thoughts. The beautiful thing about this is that God has embraced our vulnerability. Jesus knew that this is exactly what the disciples were feeling when he was being crucified. So he promised them that he would leave them his peace. The same promise applies to us. The peace Jesus has imparted to us can never be found elsewhere. You may seek comfort from your favorite places and be with your favorite people, but in the end, the solace you can derive from these activities is incomparable to the peace he first gave us. It's already within you, my friend. You have to activate God's peace by casting all your anxiety to him and believing that he is overseeing the situation you're in right now. 
God truly has control over your life as long as you are faithful to Him. He could not care less about your status in life or other factors. All He needs from you is your trust and loyalty. Once you have proven yourself as a faithful servant, He will not hesitate to return the favor a hundredfold. Joseph stands to be one of the most relevant biblical examples of outstanding faith. Imagine the situation. His brothers wanted to get rid of Joseph so badly that they faked his death and sold him. After that, he had to start from scratch and work in an unfamiliar land. Not once did he express his frustration to God. He believed even when it was painfully difficult. Joseph was emotionally and physically weary, but his heart remained strong because of his faith in God. Joseph literally had no doubts about God's plans. The Lord was then pleased and gave Joseph an esteemed position as an official. A big misconception, though, is that when we see things are progressively not getting better, we start to think that God is not handling our situation. You might have asked, if God is truly on top of the situation, then why is it not getting better? Let me tell you why. Just because the circumstances are not going according to your plan doesn't mean that it's not good for you. Only our Father knows the best measures for your growth, so trust me that everything that is happening is allowed by Him. God's in charge. In the eyes of the world, your situation may look ugly and hopeless, and it's totally fine because we do not aim to please the world anyway. We strive to obey His word and trust His decisions no matter what it looks like. Who cares if everything seems messy? So what if nothing is right anymore? The fact that you are in this position only shows that God is about to lift you up. Every difficult position is just a stopover. It's temporary. And I know this because He has always been vocal about His good intentions for us. Only God knows how amazing the bigger picture truly is. Hold on to His promise and He will reveal it very soon. Do not try to outplay our Creator, because you will never win. Did you know that in team sports such as football and basketball, there is an amateur mistake that takes place when a player becomes focused on showing off their skills rather than cooperating with the team? This happens when the player keeps the ball and refuses to rely on their teammates in order to prove something. They feel that they can single-handedly lead the team to victory by going solo rather than trusting others. This kind of selfishness goes against the strategy laid out for the team, which results in a disrupted performance. Now let's take this concept away from the context of sports and relate it to your relationship with God. Psalm 118, 6-7 reads, The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper, I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. God is playing on your side. He is your coach, but more importantly, He is also your teammate. The thing is, there needs to be equal effort and commitment between the two of you. There is no way you can possibly outcompete God in the game He made, which He also has a strategy for. Sometimes we tend to treat God as an opponent without even realizing it. You may not openly attack or hate him, but when you keep the ball to yourself and deny God the chance to play his role, you're showing your lack of confidence in him. It's a nonverbal way of telling God that you think you can handle the situation better than him. Do you think this is true? Your anxiety, doubts, and stress are direct indicators of the amount of faith you have in him. This is a reminder that there are moments when God sees this behavior from us when we are in difficult places. It's unavoidable for humans like us, and so, as followers of Christ, we are responsible for keeping our outlook in check. American pastor Harry Ironside once said, the greatest mistake any Christian can make is to substitute his own will for the will of God. Additionally, Proverbs 11 verse two says that, when pride comes, then comes shame but with the lowly is wisdom. Let us learn to humble ourselves before God and confide in His ability to maneuver the situation for us. God is forever on your side, whether you like it or not. Even if our hearts become stubborn and our egos are too inflated to ask for help, God always chooses to fight for us. 
He is the author of your life. It is only right to trust that the following chapters will bring you joy and fulfillment. He has been in control of everything from the beginning of time, and he will remain in control until the very end. The only thing he cannot fully dictate is your free will, because he wants you to take initiative in demonstrating your faith. God wants you to freely let go of your problems here in the land of the living and submit them to him. Honestly, why would you want to carry your burdens all by yourself? Jesus has already carried the cross for us, and it's what he is still doing now. It's the Lord's pleasure to journey with you. He will show you the ropes because he created everything after all. Who are we to deny him this? In Isaiah 14, 24, the Lord of hosts has sworn, as I have planned, so shall it be. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand. All you have to know from here on is this. The Lord planned to give you the best and most pleasant things in life, and no one can break this promise. Not even financial problems, evildoers, or family problems can threaten the integrity of His plans. Really, nothing can sabotage the plans God has set forth for you. May your heart be still in His peace, for He has everything covered. Sometimes, the best thing you can do is not think, not wonder, not imagine, and not obsess. The best thing you can do for yourself is to just breathe and have faith in God that everything will work out for the best. Throughout the Bible and since time immemorial, one of the most consistent things God's been telling humanity is that we should fix our eyes on Him. Even today, God's telling you to fix your eyes on Him. As you do, you'll eventually begin to see what God is doing, has done, and will do. You'll begin to see Him and His work, and your focus on other things around you will become weaker. Music minister Kent Henry penned down these beautiful words in his classic worship song titled, When I Look Into Your Holiness. When I look into your holiness, when I gaze into your loveliness, when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you, when I found the joy reaching your heart, when my will becomes enthroned in your love, when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you. You see, when you gaze at the light, you lose focus on the surrounding darkness. I learned something years ago using the concept of after image. When you look at a bright object for some time and then look at another object, it'll take your eyes time to readjust to the new image. Instead, you'll keep seeing the former image cast on the new object. This phenomenon of seeing an image after looking away from a bright light source is called an after image. It's a visual illusion that occurs when the eyes continue to generate an image in the absence of a stimulus. This happens because the photoreceptors in the retina continue to fire even after the stimulus is removed, causing a lingering impression of the image. Although this is biological, it's applicable in explaining the power of focusing on the spiritual. You see, you'll begin to believe and see everything else through whatever your spirit focuses on long enough. If you focus on how tough things are for too long, even if situations change for the better, you'll still deal with the new situations as if they were as tough as the former ones. Why? Because your spiritual photoreceptors, your heart and mind, have embraced them as the norm. This reminds me of the story of the Israelites in the wilderness when they come very close to the Promised Land. After journeying for a long time, they were about to enter the Promise, and God instructed Moses to send out spies to go see the land and bring them news. This was something like a foretaste of what they are about to enter, like going to see a home you bought just to enjoy the thought of living there, to see the new environment and breathe in the scenery. Well, the spies traveled, and after some time, they all returned. This was when the real battle began. The Bible says that these men came with giant fruits and great news about the land. After amusing the people and getting them excited with what they saw, they popped everyone's balloons by saying, 
but we can't go in. These people are too strong for us. The land itself devours its own people. There are giants in the land, and we were grasshoppers before them. They will squash us if we attempt to take the land. Once the people heard this, they began to mourn. Who better to tell them the truth than those who had gone there themselves, right? If you were there, maybe you would have taken their word for it too. However, out of the twelve, there were two who had a different opinion, Joshua and Caleb. These two tried to calm the people by telling them what I'm about to tell you. Here's how the Bible records their words to the people first in Numbers 1330. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. Then in Numbers 14, 6-9, But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we passed through to spy out is an exceedingly good land, if the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. What was the difference between the reports of these two groups? Was the first group lying? No, they weren't. There were actual giants in the land at that time. They had brought giant fruits, which proved that the land was greatly fruitful. However, the difference between these two was that one group focused on the difficulty before them, while the other focused on God's strength. The second group allowed their conviction of God's support to boost their confidence that the giants were considered something to be devoured. Beloved, God is going to make someone out of you that you'll look back and be amazed. The Bible tells us to rejoice when we go through hard times, not because it's easy, but because when we have the Lord with us, hard times produce greater heights of glory. Romans 8.18 says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. When the going gets tough, remember, you're not alone. God is still with you. As the battle gets intense, remember the words of his promise. I will never leave you nor forsake you. God is always with you, dear believer. You may not feel it all the time, but he is there. He wants you to believe this. Elizabeth Elliot wrote, Our vision is so limited we can hardly imagine a love that does not show itself in protection from suffering. The love of God did not protect his own son. He will not necessarily protect us, not from anything it takes to make us like his son. A lot of hammering and chiseling and purifying by fire will have to go into the process. Sometimes, God may keep you from entering that situation. Other times, he allows you to go through it and emerge victorious. Your actions do not necessarily affect him choosing what situation suits you. You see, he is God and he is too wise to be wrong and too loving to be unkind. If he allows you to be in a situation, know that he's doing so to produce something greater out of your life. If he's letting you face the storm right now, it's because he's making you a better individual and giving you a greater testimony. The tougher your battles are, the greater your testimony will be. In the story I shared earlier of the Israelites, out of the twelve spies in the older generation who left Egypt for the Promised Land, only Joshua and Caleb successfully entered the land. The others, who didn't trust God enough to believe they could enter, all died in the wilderness. And guess what? They didn't die by the hands of the giants they feared would kill them. They died from their disobedience to God. Their fears led them in the opposite direction, away from God and into the danger they feared. God understands the situation before you, even more than you do. He's the only one who can handle the situation. You can't do it by yourself. Your confidence should not be in knowing that you can endure or handle the situation. Why? 
because situations can escalate beyond your expectations. Your assurance should not come from your trust and the help of those around you. Why? Because they're limited, can fail, and have no guarantee of success. Conditions have proven too difficult for doctors to fix. Situations have proven too difficult for money to resolve. What if the person lost their job? What if the person who promised to help you lost his life? However, there is one who can reach you anywhere and anytime. He's always with you. Paul wrote these words for us to know that we can put our faith in God and be sure He will not fail us, no matter how long it takes. Hebrews 13.5 Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, Never will I leave you, nor will I forsake you. When you remember that you're never alone, you'll draw strength to go through your tough times. Don't let the devil tell you that God's left you. He will never leave you alone to try to do what he knows only he can do for you. He knows you need his strength, and he wants you to know that even when you feel weak, he's there to supply you with all the strength you need. Take your eyes off the difficulty today and turn them to the Lord who's the Almighty. Let your faith come alive in knowing and believing that God's on your side. And as you trust Him and continue to follow His steps, He will bring you to a better place as a better person. Let me leave you with these encouraging words from the book of Psalms. Psalm 66, 8 to 12. Let everyone bless God and sing His praises, for He holds our lives in His hands, and He holds our feet to the path. You have purified us with fire, O Lord, like silver in a crucible. You captured us in your net and laid great burdens on our backs. You sent troops to ride across our broken bodies. We went through fire and flood, but in the end, you brought us into wealth and great abundance. Your intimate relationship with the Lord grows stronger during your suffering more than in any other season of your life. Often we think we're cursed, but that's so far from the truth. Sometimes hard times show that you are so blessed. You get to experience God unlike other believers around you. So many people are seeking the presence of the Lord to no avail, but you can drop to your knees and enter the presence of the Lord in seconds. When everything is going well in our lives, our hearts are going in 10 different directions. When you're going through trials, you're more inclined to seek the Lord with all your heart. Let this be the time you shut out everything around you to acknowledge that you're not alone. The Almighty is with you, and He's faithful to see you through this. Within each of us exists a battlefield, whether visible to others or hidden deep within our hearts. Perhaps it's an issue of health, gnawing at your peace with its frightening uncertainty. For others, it may be the relentless pressure or financial burdens or the complicated labyrinth of decisions about money that lies ahead. Regardless of your struggle, we're all united in our battles. Even in our world of connections and communications, it might be the trials of relationships that test you. Perhaps it's the pangs of loneliness or a strained bond that is stretched to breaking. Your dilemma might even lie in deciding whether to continue with a particular relationship. Whether the nature of your battle, remember that it's unique to you, invisible to the rest of us, but not to our Lord. It's an absolute truth, a soothing balm to our troubled hearts, that God is fully aware of our struggles. The omnipotent and ever-loving Creator is ready and waiting to guide us through our battles and lead us toward victory. The condition? We must trust Him and permit Him to steer our course. Our Lord reassures us, your battles are mine to fight, your troubles are mine to bear. Christ's comforting words echo in our hearts. Trust in me. Let your anxieties ease. Don't allow your worries to consume you or hold you captive. Now, take a moment to ask yourself, do you entrust your battles to God, even when the journey He plots doesn't align with your reasoning? Do you have faith that His plan will lead you through? The key to letting God fight our battles is faith. Faith that His ways, though they may seem unfamiliar or difficult to comprehend, are designed to lead us to victory. 
His wisdom transcends our understanding. His love wraps around our struggles and his strength is our refuge. In the face of battles, let's anchor ourselves in his grace, bask in his love and find rest in his promise. As we navigate through the landscapes of our lives filled with various battles, may we be confident to let God lead the way, trusting his wisdom and leaning into his love. This faith is the beginning of victory in our battles. Surrender your battles to God and let him be your champion. You are not alone. You have the greatest ally and he is ready to fight for you. Let God fight your battles and watch the way he works miracles in your life. In the world of dating, you might find yourself in situations where it feels like you're engaged in a fierce battle. It could be the constant striving to find the right person, dealing with heartbreak, or perhaps feeling overwhelmed by loneliness. There might be times when you're praying to the Lord, seeking for a particular resolution, and it seems like the reply you get is not what you've been hoping for. You might be questioning, why is the struggle ongoing? Why aren't my prayers being answered in the way I want them to be? Here's something to remember during these challenging times. Keep faith and place your trust in the Lord. Grasp the profound realization that you're not traversing this battlefield alone. You are accompanied by the most powerful protector and he is always with you. He does not abandon his children. Remember, the compassionate savior who looks over you that knows every struggle, every hardship you face. This is the Jesus who lifts the heavy burdens from our shoulders, who breaks the chain of sin that weighs us down. He is the one who guides us through to our promised destiny, the land of peace, love, and joy. No matter where you find yourself on your faith journey, even the depths of your personal wilderness, take solace in the knowledge that he will guide you through whether you're single, in a relationship, or navigating a complicated situation, remember that the battle is not solely yours to fight. It's essential to approach dating with this awareness and trust your worries, your fears, and your hopes about your love life to Him. Let God take control of your battles, for His plans are greater than anything we could ever envision. Sometimes we may not understand the delay or the detour, but rest assured, Every step is a part of his grand design. To let God fight your battles does not mean you stand idle. It means to do your part while trusting that he is working behind the scenes, aligning the right opportunities for you and equipping you with the strength you need. Dating, just like life, is full of challenges. But when you surrender these battles to God, you find the peace and confidence to face whatever comes your way. Your journey, the battles you face, are not just about finding the right person, they are about your own growth, your spiritual journey and your faith. Embrace the journey, surrender your battles and trust the process. The Lord is your ultimate companion in this journey of love and he is ready to fight your battles. In his time, you will see his plans unfold, leading you to love that is not only romantic but also divine. God, the Almighty, has the power to part that intimidating sea before you revealing a path to victory. He is indeed your advocate, your defender, gloriously fighting your battles on your behalf. Visualize your life as a radiant canvas, filled with the beauty of faith and trust in the divine. It is truly a profound way to navigate your journey, particularly when it comes to love and companionship. Remember, he is committed to championing your cause to ensure you come out victorious. Trust in his promise, he will never let you falter. God's enduring love for you is like an ever-flowing river, offering you solace and guidance in your dating journey. He stands ready with arms wide open, yearning for you to confide in him. Place your absolute faith in his wisdom. By doing so, you open the door for him to banish all concerns clouding your heart. Your worries about dating issues, temptations, and uncertainties will dissipate like mist before the morning sun. God's intention for you is absolute freedom from these burdens. He is the locksmith with the unique key to unlock the chains of anxiety and doubts that often accompany the quest for love. His gift to you is a life adorned with the kind of joy that comes from trusting His wisdom and guidance. The Holy Scriptures mention that even when the ground beneath us crumbles, have you ever felt your world spiraling out of control? 
relationships terminating unexpectedly, job prospects dwindling, health of loved ones deteriorating, an unforeseen accident, a sudden breakdown of your vehicle. When it feels like every aspect of your life is waging a war against you, where do you seek strength and stability? The choices you make in those instances speak volumes about your faith, about your belief system. When your world is in chaos, where do you turn for support? What are the constants in your life that provide you stability? Our Father in Heaven is our sanctuary, a term that essentially signifies a place of safety from harm. He is our safe haven during the raging storms of life. Moreover, He's not just our sanctuary, but also our source of strength. God reigns supreme. And if we're members of His spiritual family, He isn't just confronting us, He's contending for us. So, refrain from depending on your own strength and abilities, and instead, experience tranquility in His sovereignty. Let go of your need to control and immerse yourself in the serenity offered by God's control. These principles hold true as well. Do not rely solely on your judgment or strength while navigating through the intricate dynamics of a relationship. Surrender your struggles to God. Let Him fight your battles. Know that even amidst breakups, rejections, and heartbreaks, He is there, upholding you, providing shelter, and turning your battles into blessings. Remember, His love and wisdom surpass our understanding. So let go and let God take the reins. His control is absolute, His plan flawless. This, my dear friends, is the essence of inviting God into your dating life. He does not merely want to be part of it. He wants to guide, protect, and nurture it. Let Him fight your battles and prepare you for a love story that is beautifully woven in His divine plan. Trust in His timing, surrender to His will, and rest in His love. Our anxieties often stem from our attempts to unravel the mysteries of tomorrow with the hours of today. The clock ticks away as we spend precious moments dwelling on uncertain futures. Yet the question arises, why doesn't God unveil the entirety of our lives to us? Why don't we get a complete blueprint of our journeys? The divine design is such that it requires us to lean on faith moment by moment, day by day, it's not about our capacity to foresee, but about our willingness to trust Him. Remember, no obstacle you encounter is insurmountable. The wisdom in the scripture reaffirms that all things are feasible with God. They might seem impossible to human calculations, but divine equations always balance out. Maintain that relentless faith and witness how God continues to act. The promises He made to you, they are bound to bloom in reality the time frame of their manifestation, the ease of difficulty of the journey. Those are chapters yet to be written. But one truth that resonates through scriptures and experiences alike is that God is faithful. He does not abandon His children. He does not leave our queries echoing in a void. In the maze of relationships and dating, we often battle uncertainties and fears. We question our worth, our decisions, and our future. But remember, God has already conquered these battles. Allow Him to guide you through the labyrinth. Let Him carry the weight of your worries. Embrace God's plan for you. Let Him plot your love life and watch how He turns the battleground into a field of blossoming opportunities. Remember, dating is not just about finding the right person, but becoming the right person. And God, in all His wisdom, is shaping you to be just that. Genesis 41.14 says, so Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. The story of Joseph, among many things, is a story of hope in hopelessness. It is a story of loss, betrayal, pain, and restoration. How God took a young boy who lost everything he once had and placed him in the position of a king over a nation is nothing short of intriguing. But do you know that Joseph, even without any source of encouragement like you and I have today, was able to hold on long enough through the grace of God and faith in what God had told him? I believe that you are listening to my voice today because God wants you to know that your current situation is not your destination, and soon you will come out of it. The psalmist, writing about Joseph, said in Psalm 105, 17 through 22, 
and he sent a man before them. Joseph sold as a slave. They bruised his feet with shackles. His neck was put in irons. Till what he foretold came to pass. Till the word of the Lord proved him true. The king sent and released him. The ruler of peoples set him free. He made him master of his household, ruler over all he possessed, to instruct his princes as he pleased and teach his elders wisdom. I want us to look closely at how the psalmist captures and puts Joseph's experience together in a beautiful design. Would you believe that Joseph being sold as a slave was God sending him ahead of his people so that he would save them from the coming disaster of famine? It is hard to believe that in spite of his love for Joseph and Joseph's devotion to God, which he demonstrated throughout his life, God would allow him to be bruised and put in chains until the time of God's promise over his life was fulfilled. However, that you are going through odd situations or that you find yourself in a tight corner right now does not mean that God has abandoned you. It does not mean that you have derailed or that you have stopped moving. Anyone reading the life of Joseph from the perspective of human reasoning may believe that Joseph's life was on hold while he was in slavery and in prison. However, this is not true from the perspective of the Spirit. You see, Joseph's destiny was triggered into motion the moment his brothers took hold of him and sold him into slavery. Each experience and encounter Joseph had, sweet and sour, brought him closer and closer to his destiny. Dear child of God, your guarantee of a glorious future is not something you need to gain because you already have it in Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.27 To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you is the hope and the guarantee that regardless of what you are going through right now, you are coming out of it. For Joseph, it was God's covenant with Abraham and his descendants. As long as Joseph was devoted to the God of that covenant, he was steadily within the influence of God's help on his behalf. And the Bible says when the time came, the king sent and released him. The ruler of the peoples set him free. He made him master of his household ruler over all he possessed, to instruct his princes as he pleased and teach his elders wisdom. Psalm 105, 20 through 22. Beloved, your time is coming too. Please believe what I tell you. It won't pass you by. Your time will surely come. Trust God and wait for it. In one day, Joseph's life completely changed for the better. One night, he was a prisoner, and the following night, he was a prince over Egypt, second in command only to the Pharaoh. What a change of story! I urge you today, don't lose heart. Believe what I tell you. You are coming out of these bad situations you are in. To believe means to accept or consider something as true, honest, or real, based on a statement, evidence, opinion, or supposition. I am not asking you to believe because I feel it is the best thing to do. I am not asking you to believe because I want to motivate you. I am asking you to believe because God said so, and God can be trusted. God can be trusted, my friend. No one is as reliable as He is. God is also interested in you because through faith in Jesus, you are God's child now. Therefore. Your interests are His interests. Your struggles are His concerns. And your victories will always result in His praise. However, if you cannot believe, then nothing can change in your life. Maybe you are in court right now, and you feel the case is not going your way. You may have prayed, and it seems like nothing is happening. I don't know how, but God never fails those who trust Him. He will bring you out of that bad situation in the best way possible. It may not be the way you expect, but He will definitely do so. I remember a testimony shared by a young man who was involved in a crisis with a law enforcement officer. 
he had harassed the officer, was arrested, and was taken to court. In the U.S., the penalty for assaulting a police officer may vary by state and by the degree of the assault. Depending on the severity of the injury and the weapon used, the minimum sentence is two years in prison, but the sentence could be 25 years or more. This young man, who was also a new immigrant, knew this would be a serious issue. He had not used a weapon, but hitting a police officer is a serious issue. And he could tell when his family members broke down in tears about how his bad behavior had finally landed him in trouble. The night before his hearing and sentence in court, he said that he knelt down in his cell and cried out to God. He asked for God's intervention and made a commitment to follow Jesus all his days if God would bring him out of this situation. He prayed and prayed until he was tired. Then he went to sleep, hoping for a miracle. The next morning, he was arraigned in court, and his case was read before the judge. The judge called to the officer who was assaulted to come to the witness stand and make his statement. The court went silent. When the officer came to the stand, he was asked if this was the person who assaulted him. The officer looked at the man who had his head bowed in shame and fear. And the officer said, that wasn't him. The man was so surprised that he raised his head to look if the officer knew what he was saying. The officer kept his gaze on him while the question was repeated, and he said the same thing. I know who assaulted me, and that's not him. Both the officer's representative in court, as well as the man and his lawyers, were surprised at the turn of event. The judge was upset and asked why the case was brought before him then. He ended the case there and dismissed everyone, calling in the next case. The man was still surprised. He didn't know what to say or do. His family members gathered around him, praying for him, congratulating him, and warning him to learn from this and never repeat it again. Though he smiled and thanked everyone for their prayers for him, he couldn't shake what just happened from his mind. He took a different exit and headed straight for the elevator alone. As the door was closing, the police officer he assaulted stepped in and joined him in the elevator, with just the two of them heading down. The officer stared at him. The man was so embarrassed and didn't know what to say or how to react. Then, as they approached the last floor, the officer said, Despite all that happened back there, you know and I know, and God knows, that you were the one who slapped me, but I am letting this go now. And he left. This man learned a valuable lesson that day, and this experience changed his life, affecting and restoring his faith in God's ability to step in for those who believe in him. I have heard testimonies of people who were delivered from terrible situations before they escalated. And I have also heard of those who got into bad situations and went down under them. But God still showed up to deliver them. Whatever stage of bad situation you may be in right now, know this one thing. You will definitely come out of it. You need to believe and trust God with it. The Bible tells us that everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly, will always turn out for our good. Why? because we love God and we are called according to His purposes. What does it mean to be called according to His purposes? <sighs> it means that you are living according to God's will for your life. It means that you are committed to serving God and living in His truth. Therefore, no matter how bad the situation is for you, God is with you and He will bring you out of it. Don't stop believing. Don't stop believing. Pray over it and believe that the one who promised will do it. He is the faithful Father, and He will never disappoint those who put their trust in Him. Psalm 25, 3 No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame, but shame will come on those who are treacherous without cause. The seas may rage against you, the lions of this world may roar, Although the mountains of debts, struggles, and family crises may stand tall before you, 
Do not give room to fear and despair. Instead, trust the Lord and believe what His Word says. No one who ever hopes in Him will be put to shame. Your life will not end in shame. You may have seen some shame, and it seems like that is the end, but it isn't. Your morning is about to come, just like Joseph. Keep believing in that vision of the future that God has shown you. Soon, the night will be over, and it will be lost in the past forever. As you listen right now, I'm praying for you. I pray that deep within your heart and within your spirit, God will help you see what He is about to do in your life. I pray that you will begin to sense that He is about to make your life beautiful again. It's not over yet. Dear child of God, don't lose your grip. Instead, keep holding on in faith and trust the Lord. The Bible says in Hebrews 10.23, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And it adds in 1 Thessalonians 5.24, The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. If he called you out of the darkness, out of the world, out of sin, and out of the crowd to his light, to himself, then he will do it. I've observed a common thing recently, and I hope to encourage your faith away from this challenge. Lately, I noticed that the Lord has been giving the church messages to his people on the subject of despair. We were always talking about and reaching out to saints struggling with sin and other ungodly habits, but now we are forced with the great challenge of despair. More and more individuals, and I mean consistent and honest believers, continue to struggle silently with despair. This despair is fear and depression over the past, present, and the future. I once sat with a brother who opened up and told me that he recently had a talk with another brother in faith who was struggling with depression. Child of God, many of us are at different phases in our lives and many are weary. Many are exhausted and don't know if they can hold on much longer. When you look around, perhaps it feels like you are all on your own. It feels like you have no friends, no family, no trust, and no help from anywhere. You pray, you serve, you give, and you show love, but it seems like nothing is happening and you are going further and further down the path of depression. I believe that God is sending this message to you, that He is not done with you yet. I want you to hold on to these words from the psalmist in Psalm 34, verse 19. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. Psalm 34 as a whole is very interesting. The writer feels the influence of God's faithfulness and tries to express it through exclamations of joy. In the psalm, he expresses his gratitude for his faith in God, and at the same time he explains the benefits of that faith to us, the greatness of his belief in God and his feelings towards him. One of the most profound phrases in the above verse is the righteous person. Within these words lies the secret to your hope and security, my friend. God may not deliver everyone, but you see the righteous person, the person who walks with God in faith and obedience, has hope, no matter how deeply they are in trouble today. I remember a time in my life a few years ago, certain unprecedented things happened that pressed me so hard that I became suicidal. I had given so much of myself to the things I believed and when it seemed like they didn't turn out the way I anticipated, every part of me struggled to believe that God was in my story. Every part of me struggled to accept that I was still in the will of God. Today, I'm alive to share this testimony of God's faithfulness, but then I couldn't see that reality. It was impossible for me, by myself, to see beyond my hurt, my disappointment, and my anger. I was on my way home one day contemplating how to best end my life because I couldn't see any reason to live. 
As I walked down the street, I heard this verse in my spirit, like a whisper. Psalm 27, verse 1. When I got home and read it, this is what it said. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I had been overwhelmed by words that told me I was a good for nothing and a failure, and that I had no future. But these words brought me peace that kept me from doing any harm to myself. The Lord is the strength of my life. I found this and my faith was restored back to the Lord. In time, God would show me that He was with me as I went through the dark phase of my life, and He gradually brought me to where I am now. This is the same as what David said earlier. The righteous person has many troubles, but God delivers him from them all. The hope of the righteous person is that the Lord God is on your side. Maybe you haven't had the time to ponder these words before, but look at them deeply right now. Who is the righteous person? They are the one who has put their faith in Jesus and committed themselves to serve Christ without holding back. They are the person who has decided to entrust their future unto God's hands. They are that person whom God has declared free of sin, not because they're perfect, but because of what Christ has done and their faith in Christ. Troubles are not the problems of the righteous, not because they won't come, but because they do not mark the end of the righteous. The righteous has only one end. It's found in God's word. Psalm 37, verse 37. Mark the blameless man and observe the upright, for the future of that man is peace. And Paul would write, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You may not look like it today, but you are the most privileged and fortunate person on the earth if you are in Christ. Your life may not look like it because things aren't their best right now, and you continue to struggle to see any reason to hold on in faith, but I bring you these words from God. Your trouble is not your end. Your current situation is not your final destination. Troubles are not the end of the believer. The righteous have many, many troubles, but the righteous also have a God who stands by them throughout all their troubles to deliver them from them all. The Bible says that even if the righteous falls seven times, they will rise again. Again, I say, who is the righteous person? They are the person whom God has declared free of sin, not because they are perfect, but because of what Christ has done in their faith in Christ. David wrote about the fortune of blessedness of the righteous person in Psalm 32, verse two. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. You are blessed in Christ Jesus. God is not using the darkness or failures of your past to consult your future. His thoughts about you are good thoughts, and He plans to give you a future, a blissful one at that. Your faith will continue to deteriorate the more you focus on those things that are not working or those things that you are going through. You see, the only thing about the power of faith is that it is only as powerful as the encounter in your spirit. This means that if there is no encounter with the Word of God, if there is no exposure to the light of God's Word, then your faith will starve and be eroded with the darkness of doubt and unbelief. Before long, you will find yourself doubting and attacking the very things you once encouraged others to believe in. For your faith to grow and remain strong, I encourage you to stay with what God has said about you in His Word. The closer you are to God's Word through personal study, through consistent prayer, and through fellowshipping with other saints and keeping company with those who remind you of what God's Word says, the more chances you have of powering through your dark seasons. These chances are for you to see the light in the future, even in the most unfavorable situations. 
Can you imagine if I couldn't hear the word the Holy Spirit placed in my heart that day as I was heading home to end my life? Imagine if I were surrounded by unbelievers who lived in the same depression as I did. I don't know what would have become of me, but thank God that the Lord helped me hear when He spoke. You see, the Word of God you take into your spirit today will speak in the day when you have nothing else to hold on to. The righteous, whom the Lord will always help, shall live by faith. This is what the Bible says. This faith is not in a person's promise, but it is faith in the Lord God, the creator of the universe, with whom nothing is impossible. I encourage you to hold on in faith and trust God. The devil wants you to let go of your faith. That is why our fight is called the fight of faith. It is a fight to remain in the faith. It's a fight to stand strong in the faith, and our fight is the shield with which we defend against the arrows of the enemy. If you let your faith go, you expose yourself to the enemy's attacks. But when you hold on to your faith, soon the enemy will run out of arrows to fire at you. You need to hold on in faith and trust God, just like Job held on to his faith in the Lord and said, All the days of my appointed time will I wait until my change comes, and I know that my Redeemer lives, until God indeed showed up. And if God showed up eventually for Job and made his ending better than his beginning, how much more will he show up for you? Trust God and hold on to faith in him, my friend. He is about to make your life beautiful again, regardless of whatever you may have lost.